Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Julia Bartz. Julia is a Brooklyn-based writer and practicing therapist. Her fiction writing has appeared in the South Dakota Review, Indigest Magazine, and more. The Writing Retreat is her first novel. Welcome, Julia. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so glad to have you. And I just saw yesterday, congratulations, this is the Book of the Month Club choice, too. Thank you so much. What an exciting, right? Crazy. Yeah, it's very surreal, but I'm sure. (laughs) And this is your debut. So everything is so new and exciting. And, um, you know, I'm sure it's crazy, too. But you got to just cherish the moments because, you know, these are you know how long it took to write the book and all the editing and all the work and getting everybody. So now we're holding it in our hot little hands and we get to celebrate. Mm -hmm. So before we get before I dig into all the wonderful things I loved about the writing retreat. Can you tell our listeners um, a little bit about the book? Sure. So the writing retreat is about a young woman um, named Alex, who has pretty much given up on her dreams of becoming a published author when she receives a once in a lifetime opportunity to attend a writing retreat that's being put on by her favorite author, the esteemed uh, feminist horror writer, Rosa Vallow. Um, when Alex gets there, she realizes that um, not only is this a retreat, it's also a writing contest. And Rosa is asking all the attendees to basically write a novel within one month, the month of February. And she is planning to give the winner a seven figure um, publishing deal. <laughs> so everyone's pretty excited about that. I know, right. We'd all take that. I love that. Um, but uh, Alex, you know, jumps into her novel and is excited about it. But then strange things start happening within uh, Rosa Vallow's mansion. And eventually one of the attendees goes missing. So Alex has to figure out what's really going on with Rosa Vallow and her estate, or she may go missing too. That was fa- That's such a good teaser. I mean, really, there is so much <laughs> happening here. And, and one of the things I actually really love about Alex's novel is it's there is, you know, the 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 incredible mansion that Rosa, had, you know, bought and eventually, you know, refurbished and and now lives in. Um, what has sort of a, a story of its own, right? It has a past. Um, about you know, and can you tell us a smidge about that? Because that is actually the story that Alex writes, which so it, it has this sort of ghostly element. Um, as well, which of course I, I absolutely love. Not that there's necessarily go- there's no ghosts in the story, per se, but in her mind, these people are speaking to her. So tell us about Daphne and Horace. Totally, yeah. So I it's it's a this book is a thriller, but I see that it has horror elements to it because I just love haunted house stories so much. <laughs> there's so many good ones. Um, I think my favorites are. Uh, Rebecca, The Haunting of Hill House, and um, Tanana Reeve Dew wrote a really good one called The Good House. So I was interested in creating this story around the estate. It's called Blackbriar Estate. And um, the story is that there is this um, woman named Daphne who is a spiritualist who moves in with her husband, who is um, uh, a wealthy man and she starts having the seances with two other women and um at a certain point I don't want to spoil anything but Daphne and some other people end up dead or missing and nobody knows like what happened to them so I actually um loosely based Daphne on Hilma off Clint okay. she is I don't know if you've heard of her uh-uh. but she's amazing artist and spiritualist who she's actually the inventor of abstract art she did it before Kandinsky and anyone else and um, I went to see her show at the Guggenheim a few years ago and she this is exactly what she did she was a spiritualist she met with other women they were calling themselves the five and they would have seances and they would channel writing and art through them so I thought that idea was so cool 
especially since writing itself feels like channeling. So I really wanted to kind of explore that and include that in the book. That's, you know, we don't talk about that nearly enough and it comes up from time to time, but expand on that for people who are not writers, that idea of channeling, like, you know, yeah. explain what you mean. So it's so true. It's so true. It's kind of eerie, honestly. Um, it's, uh, I can talk more about the origins of, of this, of this novel story, this novel idea, but um, certain aspects of it really felt like they just kind of like landed on me. And once I started writing kind of the more final version of this book, um, it really, it did feel like channeling, you know, you sit down to write and you're seeing scenes play out, you're seeing characters say things and do things. Um, sometimes you don't even expect, you know, them to say or do the things that they, they say or do. So um, it's a really cool feeling and yeah. writing is, is really hard in a lot of ways, but I think that aspect of it is probably what keeps us coming back. Yeah, it is true. It's almost like, you know, if you, your job is really just to move your fingers and capture whatever is happening. Um, and there's, you know, like, I know Elizabeth Gilbert talks about the idea that there's like a story fairy, or, you yeah. know, I don't, and it lands on your shoulder. And it, if that's the right story for you, then all you really have to do is just like, you know, let her do her job and, and take notes, basically, as it happens. So, um, it, it, yeah, I, and I I love that about it. I love I you know I love the idea that that and the idea that these the women that of course are they're basically you know persecuted right because the spiritualist is sort of a it's like one step you know towards you know being a witch and and so there's that which you know again brings up so sort of all of this feminist like you know women with you know with spirituality or with knowledge or with you know were persecuted you know because that wasn't our role right we were, women were supposed to just you know have babies and keep house and anyway um so i love yeah. the sort of the aspects of that as well totally yeah and i actually was fascinated when i was doing a little bit of research um, I highly recommend Mira Patassin wrote a book called The In-Betweens, which kind of goes into the history of spiritualism. Um, but there is this tie that it has with feminism, early, one of the earlier forms of, of feminism, um, because it was one of the few ways that women could speak and be listened to. And I thought that was a really interesting way to look at it too. And kind of depressing, right? That they had oh, to chant people right. to be listened right. to. Yeah. Right. I'm channeling a man. And so therefore what I say is going to yeah. be important. Yeah. I mean, it is. And, you know, in some ways, you know, one of the things we reflect upon now, especially with everything going on in the, in the, you know, climate is that we're sort of moving back towards the place where it seems like men are going to try to uh, speak for us. And, um, but not to get to that. Um, so I, I want to also, I mean, one of the things that that is really also at the key, at the sort of heart of the story is this really close friendship. So Alex has this um, really close friend, Ren, um, and they were, you know, incredibly close. And then they had this falling out, which ended, you know, really abruptly and in kind of an ugly way. And Ren too ends up at this um, writer's retreat, which is of course Alex's kind of worst nightmare. Um, which and one of the things that that struck me about this is that I think every woman or you you know has had at some point, whether we were you know just young children or later in life or multiple times, that friend who felt like our best friend forever, and then something happened and the relationship ended, and it can be very devastating, as I think it was. Uh, for Alex and so I kind of wanted you to talk about the inspiration for that and sort of you know because it informs so much of the book as well mm -hmm. yeah I mean that that is something that was there from the very beginning um, the first iteration of this book actually <laughs> actually goes back to Montana which I know you're, where you're from yes. there yes um, I, I actually did a um, NaNoWriMo in uh, 2014, late 2014, so quite a long time ago. And for anyone who doesn't know what NaNoWriMo is, it's National Novel Writing Month. So I had actually forgotten that the first iteration of this book was like written in a month. Uh, I completely like did not remember that, but I went back and found that out. And I had written it after a um, trip to Montana. We went to Blue Sky and it's it's so beautiful there. Oh. Big Sky. 
Yes, big sky. Sorry. Yeah, no ahead. worries. No, that's really close to me. I'm in Bozeman, so that's about 45 minutes. Yeah, it's incredible there. Yeah, and on that trip, my family and I went to Yellowstone, and I I just thought it was so otherworldly and interesting and cool, like the chromatic pool and everything. So I ended up writing this the story about a woman named Alex who flees New York after a friend breakup from her best friend, Ren. And um, I, it's funny because in that early stage, I didn't know why they had a friend breakup and I'm struggling because I know we don't want to give any spoilers. But you figured it out. (laughs) (laughs) out And um, it's, it was really interesting to kind of learn that alongside my own journey of like learning more about myself and kind of seeing certain friendships and relationships in a different different light and um, but I will say that I think as you said a lot of women and girls have these really intimate strong connections and um, it's devastating when they end and sometimes they can end in a really brutal um, way or you know some some big conflict happens and especially when we're when we're younger we're not always able to work through it mm-hmm. so I really wanted to acknowledge that and explore that yeah and I love and I think the other thing about the girl breakup is that of course you know when you're you know when you're girls there's a sort of a pack of girls right and and you know and they take sides right so you break up and then it's all of a sudden you've lost not just your best friend but kind of all your friends and there's this weird I think there's it's a it is a very it's you know unsettling and 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 deeply emotional and I think it really does impact sort of you know how we see ourselves and how we make friends and and so and in in ways that are even maybe more impactful than breakups that we have with like a you know romantic partner so um so that's that is, I think, is incredible. I actually just don't want to go back because I love the idea that we're talking now about the first iteration of this book um, being 2014. And I think people who aren't writers or who are aspiring writers don't, you know, understand um, necessarily or know that sometimes a book really does take, you know, eight years or whatever to finally, uh, you know, find its way to sort of the right story at the right time and, and get completed. So tell us, you wrote it in a month and then did you, sh- did you set it aside? Did you work on other things? Um, I know you're also, you know, full-time you work. So I just, were there other books in between the original writing retreat and this one? Yes. Yes. Great question. Yeah. So that, that first iteration, um, and again, it was very like based off of my time, um, in, uh, Montana and and around Yellowstone too. Um, I there was a lot of the story that I found interesting. For example, um, Alex was actually one, the one who was sleepwalking in that version, mm-hmm. and Rosa was coming to her in dreams. Like she was walking out of the chromatic pool and like speaking to Alex, and she was this very otherworldly creature. And it actually turned out that she was an alien, so it was a very different, <laughs> very different book. Right. Right. Bye. Um, but something about it, like I set it aside, something about it wasn't quite working. And then as I mentioned to you earlier, the idea for like kind of setting it at the writing retreat descended on me. It was maybe like a couple of years later. I remember where I was, I was sitting outside eating lunch and the idea just like popped into my, my head, the fairy landed. Yeah. And, um, I was like scribbling down notes on my phone and everything kind of clicked into place. And I felt very excited about this. Uh, version however yeah I was I was working on another book at the time I've written two novels before the writing retreat that were not published and I was working with an agent on it we were doing a lot of drafts and she actually uh, decided to part ways with me at a certain point and that too was like a bit devastating (laughs) I felt like I was back at square one and I I wasn't sure like what to do Um, and I was wondering, like, can I really sit down and write a third book without any promise of anything happening to it? Like, there's so much work that goes into it. And I was also at this time changing careers to become a therapist. So there was a lot going on. Um, but at a certain point, I, I was just so excited about the idea that I decided that I was going to write it, um, and really enjoy the process as much as possible and use it to explore, myself my like the darkest corners of my mind and also this idea of being a failed writer so 
ironically, this is the the book that got picked up. Well, you know, and there's so much, there's actually so much truth in that. I have three books that are, I always say they're buried in the backyard, but I have three books that I wrote that never got anywhere. I had a similar agent that uh, worked with me and then, you know, you know, sort of decided she couldn't do anything for for me um and it's all very common but it is incredibly devastating at the time and and i think it this is such a solitary business it's um really i think we need to talk to other writers to be reassured that it's all sort of part of the process and to your biggest point if you don't enjoy the process of creating a book this is not the job for you because 90 something percent of it is just you alone with the words um and if you if you would love that and you're sort of like you're somebody who wants to sort of explore themes about relationships and you know how, what we'll do when we're pushed and all those things and i think it's it can be incredible and and you do sort of learn to embrace it but if you're not then it's a horribly lonely i mean you know impossible job and i say go find it you know, go find something totally different. Um, so that's, you know, that's really, you're not alone. Obviously, you know, you know, you're not alone because there's, there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of us in a similar position. So um, I've heard that that's actually pretty common. And I think, yeah, you're right. We just don't always talk about it because it feels like maybe shameful or something at the time. But um, yeah, I think as long as you can continue focusing on the work and what about it brings you joy. Um, I'm actually so interested in the work that you do and like writing series like that, that like blows my mind. That is an even bigger, like there's a bigger arc and you get to really get to know the characters so well. Um, yeah, you do, you do fall in love a little bit. Yeah. And, and in some ways it's easier because you're like coming back to people, you know, it's like visiting old friends. And in some ways it's harder because like you said, you do have to sort of keep a bigger eye on you know, well, how far in the arc do we get in this book? And is there room for, you know, them to grow in the next book? And um, it's tricky, but, you know, I wanted to just go back to, you know, something that, that um, my first book came out in 2000. So I've been at this a long, long, long time, but I have a stack of rejection letters in a um, xylophone folder. This, because of course, when I was first sending, you know, queries, they so I sent them via mail and I got, you know, mail back so I had this you know things of uh, things of rejection letters including one that was like the title of this is great and the rest of it stinks which is probably really true but at the time I was like that is so mean but I kept them and I have them and there's over a hundred of them now because of course even when you're published it doesn't the rejections don't stop and I and I kept thinking I'm gonna I'm gonna like wallpaper a bathroom or something um and then I think, oh, maybe not a bathroom <laughs> because I don't want to, I would never want to go in there, but it, it's, they, they do sort of serve as a badge of honor, right? That I think that, that what it shows is that I'm, you know, persistent is one word, stubborn is another, um, to just keep going. So I think that's, um, and I think if you talk to, to really, really successful authors, so few of them don't have, um, you know, that kind of, um, that kind of, you know, experience, of course. Um, another thing about the book that I, I thought was really interesting, and this sort of ties into what we're talking about is, is the cost of art, right? Like, what is it? What does it cost the creator? Um, what does it cost the people who, you know, who read it and are surrounded by the creator? Um, you know, I sort of what, you know, it seems to be something that is really un, sort of not, un, not too far under the surface of the, your story. And I wondered if you, you know, it sounds like something you probably thought about, um, particularly in your own experience with writing. So I wondered if you would sort of expand on, on that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's actually tied to um, what we've been talking about, which is, you um, I think that unless we're really making art for ourselves, it can be um, extremely painful because I think in a lot of ways, um, there's this like bootstraps idea of just like, follow your dreams, you'll get there, you know, like keep going. And that's great. And I think that's correct, like keep going. Um, but I think for me, for a long time, this was like my main goal. My main goal throughout my 20s was to get published and into my 30s. 
Um, and when it didn't happen, it's it was again devastating. <laughs> We're using that right. word a lot. Yeah. Um, and I I almost you know quit because I I couldn't keep doing it to myself, and um, I felt like again a failure. I felt very shameful. That was always my identity. Like before anything else, I'm a writer. You know, I had a day job right. that I love. Um, but this, I was, you know, going to keep writing until I, I was published, but then at a certain point, like so much of it is out of your control. So, and, you know, particularly for people who are marginalized, um, you know, I have a lot of privilege, but you know, that's, that's something that, um, I think we need to be more open about. So it was actually really helpful for me to figure out kind of a plan B, you know, okay, if I don't get published, what do I want my life to look like? And that's when I actually started therapy for the first time myself. And I, I loved it. <laughs> so I'm one of those people who loves therapy. So I decided to become a therapist to kind of provide that space for other people to work through things. And it actually ended up really helping me because I think it helped deepen my characters and their motivations um, but it was just so nice to not have everything riding on this, right. this one. Right. It's too much pressure. It yeah. really is. And even when you, now that, you know, even being published, you know, it is then, I think that again, it's going to, you know, because it becomes, and I don't want to ruin your debut experience because it's going to be fabulous, but there becomes that sort of like, what's the next thing and what's the next thing. And, and every sort of hurdle is this like back to the drawing board. I loved, I interviewed Sandra Brown, you know, who obviously is phenomenal and, you know, has a hundred but New York Times bestsellers or whatever. And she said, you know, that every time she starts a new book, she thinks she has that total terror. I don't know how to do this. I don't think I can do this again. How, how, you know, I don't know how I've done it a hundred times, you know, and she, and she feels like she has to scale that wall with every new book. And it, and so part of me was like, oh God, is this the rest of my life? Like every single time we're going to be like, um, back to square one. And, you know, but it, it's also, you know, that's, it, it's also true that it is, I think there's some magic to it. There's a lot of hard work, no question, but there is some magic. And I think if we squeeze the, you know, hold on so tightly, we can, we can sort of cut off the magic. Right. Um, so I, I think your, your idea of having a, you know, a job that you, you know, it's not writing and maybe writing is your most favorite thing, but having a job you really like, um, that feeds you in a different way is so important. Um, and I think I noticed when I quit my day job, which happened about, what, um, oh God, it's probably been 15 years now, but it was all, it suddenly the writing got hard because it wasn't just like. Oh, you know, I'm a, I have this other, I'm a, you know, I do this thing. And so, and writing is my side gig. All of a sudden it was kind of all on that. So it's, it's a, it, it takes a cut. It sort of takes this toll um, in all sorts of ways. And then it also, of course, on the opposite, it, it feeds us in all really? these really powerful ways. Uh, so. And I think that's also such a gift to be able to devote, you know, more time to the writing and to be able to focus on it. Um, and I should add that I don't think it's just um, career wise, but like, where are the other places in our lives that we find fulfillment? Relationships, hobbies, um, trips, you know, other things that we're doing, pets, like, I think it's just important to remember to um, slow down and enjoy the process and also just enjoy all the other things that we have in our lives. So it's, yeah, that pressure is not too tight so true and that for this you know starting this podcast has actually been one of my just the opportunity to talk to other women who are doing you know writing incredible books and thinking about things in different ways and and to get it to explore in their brains is um is so so exciting for me so um so the are you going to set a book in montana i'm like you should come back out there's got a, there's a book there for you um oh. no yeah, I would love that. <laughs> well, I have lots of guest space because now my children don't live here. So you should feel free at, at any time. Absolutely. Um, so then, you know, the idea of the um, this write, you know, sort of the writing contest is another sort of interesting because there is this sense of, 
you know, I think we all, you know, there's a sort of natural sense of like, well, if her, you know, if her book does well, my mine won't do well, or, you know, it's not, of course, that way, but um, it puts this intense pressure on these women who, whose goal is, you know, Rosa has them writing 3000 words a day for a month. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, talk about intense pressure. Um, you know, how did, I mean, sort of, how did sort of how did that come to mind a way to in increase the tension or the conflict or yeah i think um i wanted it to i don't when i think about it i feel like if i was in that situation it would be both like incredibly exciting and also a complete nightmare <laughs> because again that pressure as we were talking about is just like raised to an insane degree um and yeah, I wanted the, I wanted to do something a little bit satirical about this feeling of competition and, you know, I have to win or I'm going up against this person or that person, um, because I think that that can come up for writers again, because it's so difficult to, you know, get to certain stages. Um, and I also wanted the opportunity to go into Alex's novel. So I thought that I needed to have a reason for her to be writing <laughs> so much. Um, but yeah, I think ultimately, I think the pressure was kind of the idea, um, this pressure cooker, and it, it increases, hopefully for readers kind of throughout the book. I don't want to give anything away, but mm -mm, it, it definitely does. The stakes definitely get higher. Um, and you know, and the thing that we didn't mention, but also sets this all up, which is, is that Alex has experienced this incredible, like a year of writer's block which is yeah. a real thing, you know, particularly I think in times of high emotion, um, you know, it's not something, you know, there's a lot of jobs you can just do, you know, without, you know, when you're emotionally kind of unsettled, but I think writing is really not one of them, right? Writing requires this incredible amount of sort of like your whole energy has to be sort of, all, I mean, good writing, right? I mean, we can all kind of throw down, not that, we, you know, uh, there's anything wrong with a, just the rough, rough draft, my dog is trying to get out the door. Okay, Lucy, come here. Come sit down. I have a, three dogs in here and one of them is like, can you please let me out? Now is not a good time. Um, okay, but I am going to let her out. So hold on one second. And then I want to talk about um, the process of like, you know, when the book was done, did you, okay, sorry, pause. Everybody knows I have dogs on this podcast because they're always, I love dogs. I know. I have three dogs. Julia might be a few, couple, couple dogs too many. <laughs> but anyway, okay, sorry about that. Sorry, everybody listening. That was Lucy and Scotia. They had to get outside. Um, so okay, so you finished this book. Um, and then did you finish did you query agents with a completed manuscript or did you query it with a the sort of the close partial to the end? How did that happen for you, the sort of second go around? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So um Actually, can I quickly answer another thing that you were kind of bringing up a second ago? Of I course, I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, with regards to Alex's writing block, um, I think something that I wanted to show was um, how people can get out of it sometimes. And I have I have things that I do, you know, when I get writer's block, sometimes I think like free writing can be helpful or watching, you know, shows or movies or reading books like in the genre can be inspiring or talking to friends can be helpful. Um, but I also wanted, um, I wanted to really explore this mess, messed up, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, mentorship that happens between Rosa and Alex. And I, I'm really fascinated by those types of mentorships. Um, Silence of the Lambs is one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. um, so this idea, Whiplash is another one that I really loved. So this idea of someone pushing, a mentor pushing their mentee almost to their limits, but also yeah. helping them do like, their best work. I thought that idea was so fascinating. And I like how Rosa in uh, not always appropriate ways really does inspire Alex. And there's a scene where Alex um, comes up with just like this visual for the first scene of her book and she's kind of off and running with it. So I really wanted to kind of explore that too. Um, so in terms of my agents, yeah. So I, in my day, I have queried hundreds of agents. Again, I could wallpaper probably my whole apartment. <laughs> um, but uh, I, 
finished the I finished the whole draft, and at that point, I had had several close friends read it, offer feedback. Um, and this is also the first book that I really um, kind of plotted out beforehand and was like very, oh, now my cat's coming over to say hi, <laughs> um, that I really wanted to figure out the structure and make it yeah. feel like hit every plot point because I think that can feel very satisfying. Um, I'm sure you you do that too. You have to do that for, yeah, a series. Um, but yeah, so by the time I had finished it, I I w went on a trip to New Mexico with a friend. Um, at this point, I think it was like summer 2021. And I sent out like some queries and I was starting, I started to hear back from people right away, which was super exciting and a very different experience than what I had experienced before querying agents. Um, the funny thing is that I had included the first 10 pages, pasted into the email and yeah. reads the book. The first word is a, is the F word. So later on, um, the person, Alexandra Machinist, who is my, my agent, she's fabulous, like fantastic. I'm so lucky to be working with her. Um, my sister works with her too, Andrea Bartz and Andrea was like, that's weird that you haven't heard from Alexandra. Like maybe, maybe she didn't see it. And I just thought like, oh, she's just not interested. Like, that's fine. But then we, we reached out to her, Andrea reached out to her and it turned out that my query had gotten sent to the spam folder. Because of the F word. <laughs> and that happened multiple times with multiple agents. So I was uh... so horrified by that. Um, but it all worked out. She, at the 11th hour, Alexandra said that she wanted to read it and she read it really quickly and she wanted to, um, she decided she wanted to represent me. So it was a very smooth process. That's so funny. We haven't discussed the fact that you have, that your sister is also in this business, which is so cool. I mean, are your parents writers? Like, is it a whole family of, of writers or just, <laughs> just the two of you? Yeah. I didn't, I mean, this is your show. I actually, I need to reach out to Andy because I'd love to have her on the show for her new book. I, she hasn't been on the show yet. And I, um, but um, I think, yeah, it's, I mean, I think that's so interesting. I think it does feel like it's a little kismet, right? The book was done and it, you know, you had sort of, you'd hand, you'd gone about it in a different way. And then sometimes I think walking away literally to New Mexico, kind of sending it to them out and being like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm giving this a break and then, um, uh, you know, and, and it worked out and look at you. I mean, it's, this is a, and I, you know, this is a big debut, right? I mean, this is a, not, you know, a, a beautiful, they've done a beautiful job. Your arcs are everywhere. You're in the book of the month club. I mean, that is, um, that is so, I mean, that is really like, that's kind of debut heaven, right? Yeah. yeah. And I completely credit my team, my publicists, um, everyone, I met Emily Bessler books and everyone there has been just so excited and, and doing so much. And that's, that's, yeah, it's a dream come true, honestly. Yes. Yes. Well, I, and I, I credit them all as well, but obviously most of the credit I, I give to you, Julia, because you did the work. Um, but okay. So you mentioned something that I find really interesting is that you, this round, you actually plotted, you know, you really plotted it out. So is that sort of how you think you'll do books from here on in? I do. Yeah. I used to be a pantser, which is just writing by the seat of your pants for anyone who doesn't know. And it felt, um, there's something really beautiful about doing that. It feels very organic. It feels like you're really exploring your unconscious. Um, however, I knew that for this book, which was, which is more of a thriller than the last books that I wrote, um, I really wanted to explore suspense as much as possible and that sense of suspense and dread um, because I, I love feeling that when I'm reading things or watching things. And I think to do that, you um, you really have to follow the structure, like the three-act structure. There's a couple of books. Um, the Save the Cat writes a novel book is always helpful for just showing what are all the different plot points that you have. And yeah, again, I think there's something really satisfying about as a reader to to um, not not like see the structure, but kind of feel it underneath the words. Yeah. And um, also just in terms of revelations or reveals that really add to the pleasure of reading something suspenseful. 
um, I really needed to be careful to kind of piece everything out and, and what's going to happen where. And not to say that I didn't go back and edit quite a bit because I did, but that actually, I think, made it a bit easier to write it, too. So Interesting. Kind of yeah, to know what was coming, to know what I still had to figure out. Yeah, the next sort of point where you're heading. Uh, yeah, I'm not an outliner. I really wish I were. Oh, wow. I, I know it's, and it turns out that I can make a real mess of a first draft, and then sort of have to, you know, basically reverse outline it um, later. It's not. I would not necessarily recommend it, but I do think that there's just some people just there's just the way you have to do it and. And, and as much as I'd like to do it differently, this is sort of what works, but um, okay. Well, so this one's out. Um, this is out on the 21st and I want to say, I'm going to have to cheat and look at my thing. Yeah. So this, our podcast will come out the Thursday, the 23rd. So by the time you are listening to this, um, the writing retreat is out. You can get it on your book of the month, which will be, I'm sure beautiful. They always do such a beautiful job and you can get it at your favorite independent store. You can get it wherever you can get it. It's so fun. And it does have, there's a, there's some, a little gothic -y horror, um, oh, yeah. which I really appreciate too. I really, really enjoy that. Um, so, okay. So this is fabulous. Everybody get on this, this moment. And while we have you, what is next? I, I always feel like I kind of hate that question. Cause you're like, can I just celebrate this book? But no, you cannot. We want to know what you're working on now. Yeah, no, that's a fair question. Um, I am working on my next book. I, I have like a two deal situation with Emily Bessler book. So I'm I'm deep into the next book. And um, yeah, I think if you like the writing retreat, you're, you're going to like this book too. A lot of suspense and um, a little bit more of a focus on belief systems and uh, how our realities can be shaped by the people around us. I love that. Oh my gosh. Well, that is, I mean, that's one of the things I think I like so much about this is that there's an, there's a really, you know, mom momentous plot um, that really keeps us reading, but there's so much depth in the characters and the situation and, you know, the back, the, their backstories. I mean, all of them actually, their backstories and sort of um, the, mo you know, their motivations for the things good and bad that they do. So I, I really, I love this book, Julia. It was so fun. Thank you for joining me today. Julia told me before we started, this was her first interview and yet um, she's clearly an old pro. Um, you're gonna, um, I hope you get to hear her everywhere. It was such a treat. Oh, such a pleasure. Thank you so much. So for everybody listening, that was Julia Bartz today on Killer Women Podcast. Her book, The Writing Retreat, is glorious, so fun, so deep, so um, pace, you know, well-paced and a page turner. And you will, if you're like me, stay up much too late to finish it. So um, in the meantime, we will see you at the next Killer Women. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>